Well, the Giants still suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we get to a point where three fourth quarter interceptions and a 15 point loss is actually a massive improvement, we're, we suck. We're, we're the worst team in the NFL. I don't care. You, people can throw the Jaguars at me. I don't care. We're The, the Giants are the worst by far. Um, <clears throat> uh, but man, I got to say, I really do feel bad for you Cowboys. That's poor Tony Romo. I, I You know, I used to enjoy his misery. Uh, now I just feel bad for him. It's just... He's like the Wiley Coyote of football. The world, the universe just works against him, and he fails in the most spectacular ways imaginable. Throws for over 500 yards, helps his offense put up 48 points, which would win you, what, 99.5% of football games in the NFL, and he still loses to a last, you know, an end, a pick at the end of the game. I don't understand how that works. It, it's it's mean, actually. I'm, I'm at a point where if the Cowboys won a Super Bowl with Tony Romo, I'd be like, okay, the dude, he's earned it. I, the poor guy suffered enough. Uh, he's, he's the modern-day Greek tra- tragedy of football. If, if he never wins a Super Bowl, that's like... Uh, it, the, the tragedy of Tony Romo will be... This ongoing legacy that'll... It, it's going to be so weird. It's such an odd chapter of modern-day NFL history. It's its just weird. Um, I mean, that game was basically a microcosm of Tony Romo's entire career and how it's played out. It's, it's, it's insane. Um, I mean, Eli at least has two rings. <laughs> Tony's, Tony plays really well, and he's not a bad quarterback. He's really not. And I'm saying this as a Giants fan. He's not a bad quarterback. It's just... God hates him for some reason. I don't know. <coughs> it's it's bizarre. But, yeah, a lot of wrestling to get through. Um, mostly Battleground and the Raw afterwards and some of the buildup for Hell in a Cell that's come up as well. Um, I did order Battleground. I missed the first half hour because I watched the Simpsons Halloween special, uh, which I have to say was actually pretty good. I haven't enjoyed the Simpsons that much in a long time. Uh... The opening, directed by Guillermo del Toro, was really cool, and the Dr. Seuss parody they did was actually really awesome. That was uh, very well done. Um, So at least the Halloween special was good. They still put effort into that. I can't speak for the rest of the show, but um, that that, that episode was good. Um, But I did go back and watch it. The only thing I missed was the Rob Van Dam Del Rio match. I went back and watched it, and... It was okay. I didn't really... Again, I don't really care um, about the world title or this feud or anything about it. And I've seen this Rob Van Dam match before. It's it's the same thing I've seen a million times. It wasn't anything uh, overly spectacular. It was all right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Then we got this really weird bonus match with no substance to it. Um... Uh, Santino and Kali versus the Real Americans. The only cool thing about this match was the giant swing uh, that Antonio Cesaro did to Kali, which kind of justified the whole match, but it still wasn't very good. Um, they did it the next night on Raw. Actually, they repeated a lot of things the next night on Raw um, for Battleground, so was, I guess almost nobody watched the show. <laughs> but it was, I'm one of the few nuts that actually ordered it. Um, but, yeah, this match wasn't good outside of the giant swing. Um, then we got, was it, was it the IC title match next? Because I, I got a rant to go on here. Uh, okay. Not only was this match boring and awful, it perfectly highlights what I'm talking about when I say that Curtis Axel doesn't have it. When I say that Curtis Axel doesn't have it, you know, you look at the rest of the matches on this card, and a lot of the matches on this pay-per-view fell flat. Um, the tag match I just mentioned, that fell flat. The Divas match, meh. Um... Punk and Ryback, Ugh. Uh, the, Bri- uh, the Bray Wyatt, um, Kofi Kingston match, uh, there was a lot of meh on this card, um, but it wasn't due to lack of effort. Uh, a lot of these matches falling flat had more to do with the fact that a lot of them weren't built up very well or weren't built up at all. They were just thrown onto the pay-per-view, uh, some of them last minute. I-, I didn't know the tag match was happening, and I didn't know Bray Wyatt versus Kofi Kingston was happening, so... Um, that tells you how much they really built up those matches. Um, but even in those matches, whether it be Antonio Cesaro's giant swing or Bray Wyatt doing the Exorcist uh, spider walk, which I enjoy an Exorcist reference as much as the next guy. That's my favorite horror movie ever. So, okay, cool. Um, I, I saw effort in a lot of those matches. The Divas match, they tried. I mean, give, I'll even give credit to Brie Bella. They tried. 
to make something out of that. It wasn't very good, but they tried. Um, this match was so devoid of anything remotely interesting. Axel was the same boring self, um, just having another boring match, and I didn't give a shit. And it felt like they just like, well, it doesn't matter what the crowd reaction is or what the situation is. And yeah, these matches, and a lot of these matches on this pay-per-view, the problem is there was no build-up, no context, no stakes, no nothing. It was just random shit that they threw out there. And anything good that happened in those matches was just the wrestlers trying to make something out of nothing. This match, it felt like they had the match mapped out beforehand, and they weren't going to change it. And they just followed the script. And that was it. No intrigue, nothing exciting, nothing interesting. It was just Curtis Axel having his same old goddamn boring match. And, uh, you know, uh, that that's Curtis Axel. He's just this boring blah that comes out and has boring matches. He can have a good match with somebody good, like a CM Punk, but as a talent on his own, he's not somebody that I want to watch. And he's one of the guys that's gotten a push. I just look at him and I go, I don't get it. Like, even Ryback, and we can talk about how limited Ryback is as a worker. Um, there are ways to get around that. I look at Ryback, it's like, yeah, I get it. He's muscled up and has a look. I get it. Um, Bray Wyatt, you look at the character, it's like, yeah, I totally get it. Ultimate Warrior, you look at the character, I totally get it. Um, I don't always understand what he's saying, but I get the appeal. I get why they pushed him. Uh, Curtis Axel, I look at him and I just go, I don't, I don't understand. I don't get it. I just... He's just a nothing. He's just a void. And he's boring. Uh, the boreplex. That's what I call him. He's just... There's nothing to that guy. And that match he had with Truth was by far the worst match on the show. But without question. Um, and, and like I said, there were a lot of matches on the show that, that fell flat. But that one especially just tanked hard. And I was shocked when I looked... I, I followed the PW Torch uh, coverage of the pay-per-view. And when they said that the match only went 7 minutes and 40 seconds... I was like, really? Because it felt so much longer. Like, at least 20. It it felt like a long one, so uh, that match just... It was boring, and it was awful. And uh, perfectly encompassed everything I'm talking about when I say that Curtis Axel doesn't have it. Um, other things on the show, like I mentioned, there was the Divas match. It was kind of... It was alright. I mean, they... Again, the girls tried, but, you know, this was a title match that just kind of got thrown in there. Uh, I know it plays into the whole AJ versus the Total Divas thing, but... Um, I, I thought they were going to do AJ and Natty. What happened to that one-on-one -on -one match? They never really did that. Um, so that... It was, it was what it was. Uh, Bray Wyatt versus Kofi. Again, just a basic squash match. I like that they're having the Wyatts... Um, they keep them strong, uh, and they're having them win all the time, which is good, so that when actually do something significant with them down the road, it'll, you know, people will buy them as something significant. It's not like Damian Sandow, who has no direction now, but he loses all the time, so when he does his money in the bank cash, and he'll be like, oh, that guy that never wins? Okay. <laughs> it's one of those, and, um, yeah, but that match was just kind of, uh, whatever. Punk and Ryback was okay. Heyman is still hilarious, um... And there was some okay stuff in there. I didn't mind the finish because, to me, a low blow is an acceptable finish. I mean, it's a ball shot. Have you ever been hitting the balls? It it hurts a lot. I'm speaking from experience. Getting hit around your balls hurts, okay? So, yeah, I totally buy that as a finish. Um, the match itself was just kind of, eh, you know. Again, I, I feel like they're kind of spinning their wheels here on this whole Punk and Heyman thing. And I'm just waiting for Lesnar to come back so they can do that rematch. Um, if they're going to do that rematch, I'm just assuming that that's going to happen. Um, uh, what else, what else? Um, then there was the main event, and oh boy. Um, match started off a little slow, then it started to pick up a little bit, and then they did the finish, which, you know, I understand they wanted to do the whole thing where Big Show finally turned on the bad guys and finally, you know, rebelled against his oppressors, and that's fine. And I'm not saying that you can never do a no contest ending. Uh, some of the best pay-per-view endings I've ever seen. Bash of the Beach 96 and Judgment Day 98. Both of those featured no contest finishes in their main event. But they did it in ways that were dramatically interesting and where I was like, oh my god, what the hell did I just see? Uh, Bash of the Beach, obviously, Hogan turned heel and formed the NWO with Hall and Nash. And, I, you know, when that happened, it was like... The fans almost forgot there was a match taking place because what happened was so shocking that... Uh, I mean, that was one of the best pay-per-view endings ever. 
And then the Judgment Day 98 one, where that was where Undertaker and Kane were fighting for the vacant title with Austin as the referee. And if Austin didn't count the three to declare the new champion, Vince would fire him. And Austin said, I will not declare a new champion. So, And Austin was so over at that point, and the fans, the way the storyline went, and Austin was so over with the fans that the fans didn't want him to count the three for a new champion. So it worked in that aspect. They, it actually gave the fans what they wanted. And there was that whole drama. It's like, okay, is Vince actually going to fire him? And he did. And to me, it was one of the defining moments of the entire Austin McMahon feud. So that ending was fantastic. Um, so you can do no contest endings, and again, I get what they wanted to do with Big Show finally turning against his oppressors and everything, but it came off so awkwardly and so uh, confusing. I mean, I gotta imagine the live crowd was confused, because of the way it came off and the way it played out, um, and they didn't really know what to think of Big Show uh, doing what he did. I thought the ending to Raw, where he knocked out Triple H, was much better and a lot more satisfying. Uh, you know, made a much bigger impact, um, and, you know, you can say what you want about Raw's having better endings than, uh, the pay-per-view that you pay 55 bucks for, but, uh, that's neither here nor there, um, and, but the ending just came off as very awkward and very weird, especially with a match that they, they basically said that we, we were gonna have a new WWE champion, they didn't deliver on that, and that's just not a good way to go. And again, if they don't want to have Daniel Bryan win the title yet, which I'm fine with, the chase is fine, that's cool, why did you even have the match in the first place? My idea, my big idea, that I said in my preview video, was to use the referee scandal as Triple H's way to keep Bryan out of the title picture, so that way you can do uh, um, a tournament Orton versus whoever in the final... Say Orton versus Big Show, where Big Show is expected to lay down for Orton, and then he doesn't do it. And that's how you get, you know, that whole thing. And then Brian could either be added to the Rhodes and Shields uh, match to make it a six-man tag, or he could face one of his friends that helped him out, that ran in and helped him, as Triple H trying to do a divide-and-conquer thing, or they Triple H could put him in a... Uh, uh, a gauntlet match where he has to beat three guys like they did on Raw a couple of times. Anything, you know, give Brian a significant pay-per-view win or something. Um, and then that would build into Hell in a Cell, Orton versus Brian for the WWE title with no way... Hell in a Cell, no interference, no nothing. Uh, without doing that... And you get all of those things. The Big Show turning against his oppressors. You get... Uh, further build-up for Brian and Orton and Hell in the Cell and all that stuff without doing that really awkward finish. Uh, so I think they should have held off on doing uh, Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton at this pay-per-view. And again, what have I talked about before? With the series of pay-per-view main events, you either order the first one when it's the most fresh, or you order the third one when you kind of get the impression, or the third or fourth one when you get the impression that this is going to be the last one. And I go ahead and be dumb and I buy the second one. <laughs> I'm a moron. <laughs> I need to follow my own advice. Um, but yeah, but there was one thing on Battleground, as bad as this show was, and this was a really lackluster pay-per-view, um, probably WWE's weakest of the year that I've seen, and they've been doing pretty well with pay-per-views lately, but this one just fell flat, uh, big time, uh, with or without that ending, it was just a flat pay-per-view. The one thing they did that really stood out and was really awesome, and I want to put it over, the Shield versus the Rhodes family was outstanding, and this is what I talk about, when you give matches context and story and characters and purpose and stakes and everything else the fans will be into it um you have a reason to care and the payoff uh delivers big time and that all felt fantastic that was by far the best part of the show best match best moment best payoff best everything that was all fantastic and uh Kudos to the WWE, because they executed that whole thing perfectly. Uh, it's just a shame the rest of the show couldn't reflect that. And I'm not saying every match has to have that level of story put into it. You can't do that. But <coughs> if every match had a level of understanding and context put into it, where you had the, I, you know, like the idea of... Uh, you know, the outcome actually means something, and it means something for a character to win this match. Like, Bray Wyatt, strong character, they're building him up, that's fine, they've kept him unbeaten, and him beating Kofi Kingston is absolutely the right decision, but if there was an understanding that uh, by Bray beating Kofi, he was moving up the rankings, um, then that would mean something, but so often, uh, everything's so haphazardly put together that it doesn't really mean anything. Um... 
But, uh, yeah, they, they, you know, uh, just try to make it so that matches actually have stakes and everything. Again, it doesn't have to be to the level of the Rhodes and Shields match, which was fantastic. But uh, just try to keep that kind of sports logic that I keep talking about, keep that in, in with all the matches, and actually build up the matches as something worth watching, and, you know, it'll actually uh, pay off. Then we had Raw the next night, and... Uh, the stuff with Big Show was pretty good. I really liked the opening segment with him and Stephanie, who was dressed like an Oreo cookie for some reason. It, it just made me hungry. I'm like, wow, I could really go for an Oreo right now. <laughs> and insert whatever dirty joke you want into that statement. But no, I was thinking just straight up Oreos, because uh, I've got a tummy and uh, a bit of a sweet tooth. Um, but, uh, yeah, the stuff with Big Show was really good. Although, if he was fired, why would they play his theme song when he would come out and after the segment? And again, uh, going back to the ending of Battleground, I just love it that the show ends with his, his theme music playing. Um, because it's like he won the segment, I guess. Uh, I, I wish WWE would, and I've talked about this before, I wish they would steer away from doing that and just kind of let the moment speak for itself. You don't need the theme song. And in fact, the theme song kind of takes away from the spontaneity of certain things. Uh, it, it makes it look like it's planned, and I, I don't know, I almost feel like the WWE feels like if they don't play the theme song, the fans won't know how to react, or they won't know who's coming out, or, or things of that nature, I don't know. Um, you don't always need the theme song, especially in segments like the ending to Raw last night, even though the ending was very good, um, and uh, things like Big Show coming out and ruining the main event of a pay-per-view. That, that's also, you don't need the theme song for that. Um, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there, but the stuff... For the most part, with Big Show was pretty good. On um, the stuff with the referees, uh, Bob Backlund's still hilarious. <laughs> Even when he's botching through a promo, he's just absolutely funny. Although we all knew Sean was going to get that one. And, you know, it is kind of disappointing that the ending the battleground, the big payoff for it was we're getting the same match next month which with a guaranteed winner. So, F you whoever bought Battleground. Um, so there's that. And... John Cena's coming back prematurely, I think. Uh, they could be just playing with us. I don't know. But they've done this before with Cena where I'll be gone for six months and he comes back in two or three. Uh, I remember that Royal Rumble where he was... I think he was supposed to miss WrestleMania that year or he was supposed to come back right before WrestleMania. I don't remember. And he came back and was number 30 at the Rumble. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> it was like, fuck. And that's kind of what I'm thinking now. It's like, oh, my God. And Vicky Guerrero came back on Raw. I was like, no, no. I was happy you were gone. And Cena, I was happy you were gone. What the hell, man? And it's just, I don't want you back yet. Just... But, you know, the only way this is going to work, for me anyway, is if they have Cena beat Del Rio for the title, then they do him versus Brian for both belts to unify the belts, Cena turns heel and becomes the corporate champion. That's what I would do. It's too good to be true. Of course I came up with it because it kills two birds with one stone. You get the Cena heel turn and you unify both belts, which would make me infinitely happy, but... I, I doubt that that's going to happen, because uh, it's it's just too good to be true. Um, but that's basically it. Uh, well, oh, one thing I did want to talk about, I forgot to talk about it in my last video, because I, I really wanted to talk about it with Raw um, last week, uh, where the, uh, Los Matadores debuted, and I, I did want to talk about that. This gimmick is awful. I mean, it's awful. I appreciate that you're trying to plug as many tag teams into the division as possible, and that's great. And uh, with so many tag teams, I mean, you could do a shit ton of things at Survivor Series. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see. They could do conceivably do uh, a whole card of uh, Survivor Series matches uh, with the way the tag division looks right now. But Los Matadores, this gimmick, I, I was having horrible flashbacks to 1995. It just looked awful and so cartoony and why is their mascot a bull they if they're matadors they kill bulls why would their mascot be a bull it's like money inc why would million dollar man ted dibiase be paired up with a tax man that's like those two should never get along ever that doesn't make any sense but whatever um yeah, it's just, it's just bad 1995 cartoony WWE. And it's even worse now because at least gimmicks like Mantar and, you know, whatever shitty gimmick that they were doing at the time, T.L. Hopper, the evil plumber, whatever, these horrible gimmicks, 
as bad as they were, at least it fit with the cartoony hyper reality product that they were doing in 95 the product was terrible but at least it was like it, it fit in with what they were doing as bad as it was here it just sticks out like a sore thumb because you got gimmicks like the shield you got the wyatts you got uh, cm punk um and even like gimmicks like damian sandow and fandango it like it just doesn't fit in with the current culture of the product at all and it i don't think it fits it's so it, it's even worse uh when you look at even 3mb i think 3mb fits in a lot better with the current product than uh um the matadors do so i like gimmicks i mean the you know i'm not against you know uh weird over-the-top characters i like the wyatts i like uh i liked fandango before they ruined him um uh, I liked Simon Dean uh, way back when, so I, I like Damien Sandow, so I do like over-the-top characters. Just This is just too cartoony. It's it's like Mantar meets the gobbledygooker. It's just... It meets uh, Tito Santana, El Matador. It's, it's just awful. It's just really, really bad, and I, I feel for Primo and Epico, because I don't see this uh, working out in the long run, but... Uh, that's that. So, uh, yeah, that's all I have for now, and uh, you'll probably see me again this weekend. I don't know. My schedule might be changing soon, uh, given a new uh, career opportunity that I've been offered, so my schedule won't be as free. I, I don't think. It, it all depends on how it's going to work out, but I don't think my schedule is going to be as free in the future, but I will still get videos out to you when I can. Uh, it probably won't be uh, twice a week like I've tried to do, but... Uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the near future. I'll find out more next week. But until then, that's all I have for now. And uh, y'all, uh, keep it real. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to talk about the blackout that happened at Battleground. Um, aside from having a horrible flashback to, to uh, Beware of Dog in your house 1996, um, where we lost all but two matches because of a blackout, um, and we ended up getting the, those matches for free a couple nights later, uh, because that was, <laughs> oh, that was, uh, good times, good memories, um, of that night. Uh, just looking at a blue screen, WWE, or WWF In Your House will be back, and just looking at that for almost two hours, it was, it was beautiful. Um, aside from getting, like, a quick flashback to that, uh, the blackout wasn't really that significant, so, uh, you know, whatever. I, I went to the bathroom while it was happening anyway, and by the time I came back, it was back, so... Not a problem, uh, but I, it happened, and I should mention it, so, yeah, it, it wasn't that significant to me. Uh, but other than that, you know, I, I assumed I should mention it just because it actually happened. So, okay, that's all I've got for now, so, all right, bye-bye.